Making one or two movies per year is a huge effort. In 2022, the year of COVID, indie filmmaker Travis Mills shot 12 westerns in 12 months. And in the following year, he released those 12 films in 12 months. Travis is with us today in this episode of the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast. Welcome to the Ministry of Motion Pictures podcast, where only the foolhardy and headstrong dare to venture. For within these humble halls, you may find your heart stirred to join the ranks of a Christian film movement to storm the world with God-glorifying media. But be forewarned, this undertaking will lead you down a perilous road of hardship and scorn. And so, if you're committed to pursue this life of woe, brave soul, I now leave you to your resolute guide, writer and director, Todd Schaefer. If you've been following this podcast for some time, you'll know that this isn't your typical faith film podcast. My immediate goal is to inspire, educate, and challenge filmmakers and aspiring filmmakers who make films of faith no matter the audience. I do reach out to those who work in faith films, but I also reach out to those who work outside the faith genre, to those who don't share my faith, but they share my love of cinema. The world of micro-budget filmmaking is beginning to explode, and it's a realm that's well-suited for Christian filmmakers. Making a film for the established studio system is like making a film for an elite, hard-to-break-into club that doesn't share your perspective. It's a long game of permission filmmaking. Whereas making a film as an independent filmmaker is like starting a business. You don't need permission to do this. You just need to be willing to wear many hats and be willing to do what Alex Ferrari has so eloquently championed for many years, and that is to hustle. We're living in pioneer days of a new world of media production, distribution, and consumption. The old ways of doing things don't serve us well. We need to challenge our assumptions and think outside the box, and that's what I love about Travis Mills who asked himself, why can't I shoot 12 Westerns in 12 months? If Travis tried to get a Hollywood studio to back him up on that, it would never have happened. Now, I'm not advocating for any filmmaker to do what Travis did, or anything close. And he wouldn't either. There are drawbacks, and your health could be one of those. But what I love about what Travis did is that he set a goal that many thought was impossible, even insane, and he accomplished it. Now, Travis is a unique filmmaker. People who've worked with him have called him a machine, and 12 Westerns in 12 months was not his first rodeo. He's been hustling, making independent films for more than a decade. Just 11 years ago, in 2010, Travis founded Running Wild Films and made his first micro-budget feature film called The Big Something, and he released it the following year. Along with a handful of shorts, he made a micro-budget film each year until 2014, when he decided to make one short film a week for the entire year, 52 short films. And he released those as a 12-episode series called 52, each episode covering one month of his short films. And by the way, he also released another feature that year. For the next four years, he made five features and three episodes for a series, plus another handful of short films. In 2019, he made four features and another handful of shorts. And he did this while preparing for his most ambitious effort of all, to shoot 12 Westerns in 12 months. And that was in 2020 when Hollywood itself shut down due to the COVID pandemic. Yet Travis Mills succeeded to shoot his 12 Westerns in 12 months. And in 2021, he released those 12 Westerns in 12 months. With no time to rest, he co-produced, acted, and performed stunts in a Western called Terror on the Prairie, which was released on the Daily Wire in June, the same month he finished principal photography on yet another Western called The Five, which will be released later this year. Now you'd think after all this, Travis would take a break, but he hasn't. He's tackling his next big endeavor, a Western series called Contention, which is currently raising funds and beginning pre-production. And I should also mention that Travis writes and co-writes most of his films. So, To summarize, in the past 11 years, Travis has produced and directed 29 micro-budget features and over 100 short films. Now, Travis is not a faith filmmaker. He's a micro-budget machine who's almost single-handedly created his own niche market. There's a lot we can learn from this filmmaker's can-do spirit. 
And there's one more thing Travis did during his 12 Westerns in 12 months. He kept a journal of his filmmaking experience, and he's published it. It's a master class in micro-budget filmmaking. The book is called The Making of 12 Westerns, and you'll find a link to it on the Ministry of Motion Pictures website. And I encourage you to pick it up because it is a wealth of information. This is episode 61. Travis. Hey, how's it going? Good. Nice to see you and meet you finally. You are releasing a lot of stuff and you're in post on a lot of things. Yeah, things are finally slowing down a little bit for me. It's been quite a few, quite a crazy few years getting ready to make the 12 Westerns, producing the 12 Westerns during 2020, releasing them all, doing post on them all during 21. And then there were still some leftovers uh, of that this year. Um, of course, being involved with Terra on the Prairie, all that stuff. I just made another Western because I just needed a little bit of money to keep writing. Writing is my focus right now. So okay. things are kind of starting to wind down a little bit, thankfully. Yeah. I heard a quote recently from Elon Musk where he said um, he was looking at his 10-year plan and he asked himself, well, how can I do this in six months? And I immediately thought of you. <laughs> that's cool, almost man. like you said i want to make 12 westerns in 12 years how can i do that in a year <laughs> yeah well people told me why don't you do it in 12 years and i go well that's not impressive right you know, um, <laughs> that's that's not very that's not that difficult um so so yeah it was a you know it was a dream of mine that i developed in 2013 uh, at first, I just thought 12 features, 12 months, that's quite an endeavor. But then I thought, well, that's not really that crazy because I could make, you know, just a bunch of one room dramatic features, kind of like plays. I said, what well, would be a genre that would really, you know, turn heads that this guy did 12 of them? And I thought, you know, Westerns, because you got to do the period stuff, you got to yeah. have horses, guns, all that kind of stuff. So it was wild. Uh, it was many years in the making, and uh, I'm glad I got through it. Anyone who asks me if I do it again, I'm like, you clearly don't understand what we went through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I, I When I heard about that, I'm like, this is something this guy would never, ever do again in his life. You know, <laughs> it's the only kind of thing you do if you've never done something like it before. Um, but it's, yeah, an, imp it's was, an impressive feat. Yeah, I was pushed to the limit um with it and, and other people were too you know and it's kind of like we were just talking uh with the daily wire about the stunt that i did in terror on the prairie where i came off the horse and a lot of people say well how many times did you do it and we're like uh you only do that once because <laughs> the, the second take is when you might break your neck what's well, like yeah. you only make 12 westerns in 12 months one time <laughs> in your life because the next time you try it you're probably not going to live through it <laughs> so how many how many years did it take you to prepare for this because you shot 12 westerns in 12 months and then you had a release schedule where you released them in 12 months correct in 21 yes 21? during yeah. 2021 we put out one a month and we stuck to it which was yeah. also pretty challenging yeah yeah i can but imagine we, you know, like I said, I came up with the idea at the end of 2013. I just finished a project called 52 Short Films in 52 Weeks. So I was in, uh, clearly into this quantity uh, yeah. idea and uh, came up with the idea and started writing then. And then, you know, other things kept coming up. I kept making different feature films and I kept kind of pushing the 12 Westerns back. And then it was in 2018 that I told my mentor, Gus Edwards, I said, I think I just need to pick a year and do it and, and stick to it. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep pushing this down, down the road and um, I'm not getting any younger, you know? Yeah. So I picked 2020 as the year. And, <laughs> and so 2000, end of 2018, 2019 was when I really started to get serious, finish up the scripts, pick, pick the projects. But, you know, it's such, it's so crazy that it ended up being 2020. I mean, none of us saw that coming, what was happening in, in 20, what was going to happen in 2020. Right. And obviously that became a major factor and major challenge mm -hmm. in doing the project. Wow. So for 2013, you were developing scripts. When did you actually start official pre-production where you were uh, looking for crew locations? 
Yeah, pretty much almost all of 2019 um, was locking in the scripts, casting, um, doing doing auditions, um, all kinds of stuff, and, and you know, just kind of piecing it together as, as mm -hmm. I went because I knew that pre-production would continue throughout 2020, but that obviously how much time could I really devote yeah. to planning the next film while I'm filming the, that film. Right. But I was still having to, I didn't, I didn't really have any relaxation time. Any day off from production was filled with plans for the next film or the next two, three films. But I tried to do as much as I could. And um, in the, uh, the months, definitely the latter half of 2019. Yeah. Um, did you have a producer working with you who worked with you through all of these things? Was there anybody consistent in your crew who was helping? Yeah, you? so, you know, I did not have a true producer that was like my right-hand person from the beginning, but there were some essential people that came along that were... Uh, that I, I I I could have done it without them, but let's just say it would not have been as easy, and it mm -hmm. wouldn't have turned out as well. One of them is a guy in Mississippi, Damon Burks. He kind of came up because we shot several of them actually in the South. We mm -hmm. shot four of the westerns in in the Southeast, so he was a essential factor there. He did some producing, and then a guy named John Mars actually hit me up and with a crazy proposal. He's like. I'm retired. I was a police officer. Now I'm just an actor. He's like, I know the Western thing. I will move from California to Arizona to be part of this project, wow. which was such a like, um, drop your nets and follow me kind of moment. It was just, huh. that was one of the key moments in that process. Because I, when he said that and made that proposal, I was like, I think what we're doing is important you know that someone would make a life change to be part of it i think wow. this is an important project and he ended up being such an essential part of the process uh he was helping behind the scenes he was our armorer he helped so much with horses and, and selecting period correct wardrobe but he also ended up being one of the main actors in them uh, going from supporting roles to leads in a couple of the films. So John uh, became my right-hand man throughout the process, wow. for sure. How, so how soon did he come on? He Was came you... on, and his first film was in March, because I made two in, in Mississippi to start, Bastards Crossing and Texas Red, and mm -hmm. then March was when I moved out to Arizona to continue it. And so his first one was called She Was the Deputy's Wife. Okay. And by the end of that film, I knew, I'm like, this guy is just an essential part of my team. And we had bonded. And then the pandemic hit during that third film. And basically, John and I had to start improvising to keep the project alive. And we, we ended up writing the fifth of the 12 Westerns together, writing, planning it, producing it within a month because we couldn't do the original schedule that we planned. We couldn't do those projects. So we had to kind of shift things and create new films and improvise. Wow. That's incredible. So he came, he comes on and I think it was in March on that show, the deputy's wife um, that you wrote in your book that you had one of the worst days of your production where there was nothing really going on, but all the cumul accumulation of all the nonsense and drama just un unloaded on you and you just couldn't, you couldn't move. I mean, you just broke down. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember that specific day, but that was a tough production. You know, uh, I think one good thing about my book, you brought it up. If people are interested in the making yeah. of 12 Westerns on Amazon, a lot of people that have read it, I, I've said this needs to be essential reading for filmmakers. Yeah. yeah, It shows you, you know, the kind of things that you'll never learn in film school, that a lot of the challenges of being a director and producer is silly little human drama and how you navigate it, how you deal with it. And um, everything from issues with porta potties to just, you know, yeah. bad attitudes and actors freaking out and, 
but that was a, a really tough production. We had an actor um, pretty much threatened to quit. I had to rewrite the script at the last second, kill his character off. His character was not supposed to die. Um, it was just getting nutty. All of the actors were from California. They were listening to a bunch of fake news that no one was going to be allowed back into California because of wow. the pandemic. So it was just wild. And then to top that all off, I'm sure you read this in the book, our assistant camera person committed suicide at the end of the production. And it was just such a brutal shoot, but we got through it. We survived. We, you know, the ones of us who, um, we looked after each other, the ones of yeah. us that met. Yeah. Uh, that's, that is tough to, to manage something like that. That is just devastating. Yeah. You never see it coming. And, uh, something like that had never happened to me before. Um, but I, I just think we handled it in the right way. We, we tried to take care of each other and, you know, but yeah, yeah I mean, it it was a journey. It was that that month, and then the year in general. Definitely, uh, it changes the way you see life. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt about it. Um, so you came at this whole thing sort of as a one man show. Yeah, pretty much. You know, I, I obviously I had a lot of help along the way. I had yeah, a for sure of uh cinematographers i like to work with a bunch of people supporting me um but you know i've been at this for 12 years now i started my company in 2010 and over the years i've tried to develop partners and um, different producing partners and stuff and you know it's really tough to find someone that you can consistently work with i think it's yeah. almost like finding your life mate in a romantic yeah. way and that's not an easy thing right yeah. um and and the same thing so anyone who has a good partner should feel very grateful um i haven't found that person that can keep up with me um, <laughs> tolerate <laughs> tolerate me you know that that i just jive with that were the you know yeah. uh, the yang to my yang i think is, is isn't that yeah. the expression right so um no i, I kind of knew going in i'm like i'm the main driving force of this um and then just took any help i could get from wherever it would come yeah i, th I think a lot of producers would probably be terrified <laughs> by the prospect of partnering with you what's what's next you know <laughs> yeah another, yeah, another they, movie a month thing well you know a lot of people <laughs> a lot of things that get said about me frequently are you're a machine right people are always saying you're intense you're a machine you know um on terror on the prairie they called me the swiss army knife because i was doing anything and everything um but even on that they saw that I just kind of on a film production, I just never stopped working. Um, and uh, they were just like, yeah, any slack that needed to be picked up, I was picking it up. Yeah. So that's just kind of how I'm built. I have yeah. to, I have to work hard to slow myself down. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy it while you've got it. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So what were the budget ranges between your films? I think I think I heard that it was anywhere from a thousand to fifty thousand dollars per film. Yeah, the most expensive uh was eighty thousand dollars. That was okay. the last of the twelve heart of the gun, um, which was a very personal one for me. I wanted it to be the best. It was the last of the twelve. So we put more funds into that one. But they really ranged. I mean, the cheapest one was the one I made with my dog, The Adventures of Bannon Wild West. And yeah. I made it for my stimulus check, which nice. I think is a contender for best use of a stimulus check ever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like a bunch of people, you know, whatever, paid off some credit card debt, bought themselves a bunch of energy drinks, whatever they did. And I made a movie that will last forever. <laughs> and it was a comedy. Dog. It was a comedy. It was yeah. silent. Yeah. So there, yeah. There's a lot of really cool things about, about the, just the, the, the challenge of making a film like that i i yo it was great it was it was a lot of fun i've always loved charlie chaplin and buster keaton yeah. and this was definitely an ode to those types of films and it was also an ode to my dog you know he was getting older i knew he wouldn't be around forever yeah. he ended up dying 
uh, a year ago, uh, June 19th in 2020, 20, uh, mm -hmm. 2021. Um, but I'll always have that movie to remember him by. Yeah. And he was such a wonderful dog. He was the perfect movie set dog. And he was also a really good actor um, uh -huh. that I, you know, so very special thing to share and to have to remember bandit um but yeah so that was the cheapest of them but we ended up making a couple of for like five grand ten grand and then there were the ones like deputy's wife and texas red that were like 40 50 so still not much though i mean yeah. it's just people when they hear i made like something like the pleasant valley war for five thousand they're just like i don't understand <laughs> you know? yeah i know it's hard it's hard to get your head around unless i mean it's like you know, film school kids getting out and spending a summer together making a film that it seems like that's sort of how you do it. But, you know, I, I know that you you like to pay your people um, something, you know, even though it may not be enough, at least it it, it sets a, a, a different kind of expectation uh, for the for the shoot. But um, yeah, when you're doing a movie for five or 10,000, you really can't pay anyone except for maybe the cinematographer or the sound person yeah just putting everything into feeding everybody and stuff like that and and which is you know not ideal you want to be able to pay some someone for their time but the other aspect of things that a lot of people may not understand is that many of these people that were in these films in speaking roles sometimes big speaking roles had either never acted before yeah had only been extras so it's kind of like you might not be getting paid in cash but you're be being given an opportunity yes. that you would not get maybe after auditioning for two three years you know it's just and and it, it really can boost their career a lot of them it kind of i think kind of really took them to a new level and now i see them out there getting bunches of roles because they have a reel and stuff mm. um, to show for it and uh i think it's worth it for the experience the other yeah. thing that i would encourage anyone in a situation where they're making a low budget film and maybe they don't have enough funds to really pay pay people a fair rate is don't waste their time you know um don't keep them sitting around for hours on set right. uh, if they feel like they show up within an hour they're filming they're not wrapping late they're not you know they're they're being respected i think it goes so far i mean yeah. people come back to work with me i think just because they're like he does what he says he's gonna do he sticks yeah. to it so i think that's an essential part of working on low budgets yeah and i you know doing 12 westerns in 12 months i think anybody would would just take you at your word whatever you say you're going to do you're going to do because <laughs> you can do the impossible <laughs> maybe yeah i mean it is a nice calling card to be able to say it people think i'm nuts they thought i was nuts before and now they really think i'm nuts um but yeah i mean that when i reached out to dallas uh, uh sanye on terror on the prairie you know before terror was actually even a, a thing i I was still making the 12 Westerns. I reached out to him and said, hey, um, I got your back, man. You're being attacked in the media. I've always loved what you're doing. Um, by the way, I'm doing these 12 Westerns projects. And he was just like, what are you talking about? But <laughs> it's, let's just say it's an attention getter for sure. Yeah, it, it totally is. It really yeah. is. And, and it must be great for publicity uh, for your marketing. Yeah, well, a bunch of some of my collaborators said, you know, why at the beginning of each film or on all the posters does it say one of 12 Westerns in 12 months? I'm like, well, because this all needs to, the films need to all connect to each other. Mm -hmm. And if, hopefully if someone randomly stumbles on one of the films, they'll be like, one of 12? What is that all about? And then they start to follow the trail and the story. And I also think it's, you know, it's a thing that needs to be looked at in context, too. This is not a single movie that took two or three years to make, <laughs> you yeah, know, right. um, not to apologize or use excuses, but it, it is best viewed in context. So, yes, no, no, that's for sure. Um, so your your shooting days, how many shooting days did you average for your for each of your films? Well, I think the the max was definitely 20 because you really can't pack more than 20 shooting days into a month 
yeah. um, when you're giving people two days off between your production weeks. Mm-hmm. So 20 was the max. And then I think the, the lowest number was like nine or 10. Um, mm-hmm. So a couple of them we were able to do in less shooting days, which was nice because then I could take two, two weeks during that month and do more planning and prep for the next film. So it, it varied, you know, some of the, uh, some of the films are, are shorter um than others you know they're shorter features 70 80 minutes of course if you look at old westerns a lot of them are 70 minutes yes, long that's true the random dot westerns and stuff like that yeah which is to me a length that i actually personally really like i wish yeah. more movies were that length because a lot of times i'm watching a movie these days and i'm like i could have cut 15 minutes out of this i know, I know. Um, <laughs> but you know di- distribution standards are still kind of sticking to you know 85 90 minutes or more mm-hmm. um but yeah anyway so and some of them were in one location you know, yeah. or something like that, like Counting Bullets was mostly in one location in the Dragon mm-hmm. Mountains. And that allowed us to, even though it's it's got some fairly complicated action, it allowed us to shoot that in, I think, nine, 10 days, something like that. Wow, that's incredible. Huh. Mm-hmm. Um, you wrote an uh, article recently on your Facebook saying that you'll never do another micro budget <laughs> Western again. <laughs> yeah that's how i feel well and i think i carefully worded it i said i said i i didn't say never i said i don't want i said i don't want to and the reason i ordered it specifically like that is 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 that i know i may have to go back on that and and do one i just did this movie the five and it was a twenty thousand dollar budget thankfully i didn't have to um raise it myself there's these companies that kind of release direct to walmart dvds and stuff and they will give you if you're a competent filmmaker twenty thousand dollars to make certain genre films really and, um yeah and but twenty thousand of course is not much to no work it's with. nothing it, but it's if, surprising if, that they're if, able to get it into walmart walmart's still selling yeah. dvds i guess I, I guess i don't go to walmart often enough it's yeah oh yeah and it's i think it's a profitable enough obviously that walmart continues to do it and then companies continue to to look for that you know there's probably a lot of people still in america that are like they might have netflix but they're still kind of old school and they still want to go to walmart and grab look at what's on the shelf and a lot of people who watch watch westerns are kind of still you know, it's an older generation and they're probably still watching DVDs. So mm. we, we, I made some DVD deals for Walmart with a certain company and that's what kind of got me connected to that realm of things. Um, but yeah, I wish they would hire me, give me $20,000 to make like a, a character drama, but unfortunately <laughs> they can't, they can't sell those to, uh, to the, you know, different, different uh, stores and stuff. So Huh. I had to make this film for 20 and you know, you're just so, I feel really limited by that budget at this mm-hmm. point um, mm-hmm. for the reasons that I kind of outlined it. Um, obviously I don't want to count out, you know, the possibility of having to do that again, but uh, it would be nice to start working with more and yeah. to, to kind of take it to the next level. And uh, part of the reason, <laughs> that I feel that way is I got the chance to work on a multi-million dollar Western with Dallas and them, Gina Carano, yeah. Tara on the Prairie, and got a little spoiled, right? Mm. Because I was working with a yeah. Oscar winning makeup artist, a professional wow. coordinator, you know, and you're after working with those level of people and seeing their professionalism, you're like, I don't really want to go back to directing and boom operating at the same time. <laughs> Now, did you yeah. have a did you have a uh, cinematographer on every one of your shows, or did you do some of the cinematography? So most of the films were shot by other people than than myself. Yeah. Um, I was a, there are two guys that I really like to work with, um, and then a couple people I hadn't worked with before, and then I ended up being the true DP on only one of them, the Pleasant Valley War, um, but I was. Uh, and then I did some camera operating on, on a couple other ones, but mm. um, thankfully I had some good DPs to work with because that really helps. It's very, no 
it's very difficult, I find, to shoot and direct. Um, it, it's because it's it's just you're the whole shooting process is 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 such a um, so mentally exhausted, right. exhausting in itself. Just thinking about framing and focus and all kinds of stuff like that, and yeah. keeping shots. And then if you double that with thinking about performance and, you know, as this is why when you ask a lot of cinematographers you work with, so how did you feel about that take? They'll be like, who's in focus? And you're like, how'd you feel about the performances? They're like, I'm focused on the frame. <laughs> you know, like, they're I'm doing my job. Them. I'm not doing yes. your job. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, DPs that work with me, I've learned that I like to lean on them uh, for that kind of advice. So, so they've, we've been able to adapt, which is nice. Yeah. So how has the marketing and distribution gone for you after this? Well, you know, that's one of the hardest parts with making movies like this mm -hmm. um, because there's only so many avenues for low budget films. Right. Uh, I'm very sort of hesitant to make um, distribution deals because I made some early in my career and got really kind of screwed on a yeah. couple of them and um so i i'm i've have worked with some sales agents and distributors but i don't give them the full rights to the projects right. um, and you know the distribution streaming thing is constantly changing mm -hmm. in 2017 i made my first western blood country I put that out on Amazon and within three months it had earned back all the money from, uh, oh, wow. for the actors and it was made for $50,000 and it had no names in it. Hmm. So, but then a, a year or two later, Amazon changed its yep. way of paying filmmakers and it's not lucrative at all anymore. Yep. Um, now, thankfully, I've been able to get my movies on this service called Tubi, which is free, and that's generating a lot of income, and the, many of the 12 Westerns are well on their way to being profitable for the investors. Hmm. But it's, it's like if I was raising money for a film right now, I would have to tell an investor, I can't tell you how we're going to make money on the film because we're going to... We maybe shoot it in the next few months, release it six months to a year from now, and the game might be totally different by then. Like, I can't tell you Tubi's going to make the money for the film because by then Tubi may have changed their model. They might be not, they might not accept content at all anymore. Who knows? So you just kind of have to tell them, look, we're going to do the best we can in whatever the situation yeah. we're in. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's a tough world out there, but... The movies are out there, and I think you know, Brad Pitt said about his Western assassination of Jesse James, which bombed at the box office, he said, I believe in the shelf life of a movie. And sure enough, over the years, it's become a cult classic. It's looked at by some as one of the best Westerns of, of, of recent times. So I kind of feel the same way about the 12. It's like they're out there. And uh, mm -hmm. people can discover them, and I hope right. they have a really good shelf life yeah i mean we're not dependent upon the the release the 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 new release window anymore and like we used yeah. to be you know yeah exactly um, i've seen but, people discover films way after the fact and yeah. that's encouraging that something can kind of all of a sudden pick up steam after it's been out for a while yeah i mean the fact is there's so much stuff being released and fitting into the new release category all the time over all the services. So you can't keep track of everything. And then, yeah. you know, a few years later, you end up finding the, the, the thing. And in fact, in some ways it's better because you've at least you're able to see what kind of response this film has been consistently getting over the long haul um, to choose your, your, uh, your viewing. The nice uh, thing is that one thing, that I saw about the Western genre is that, you know, it's not oversaturated. Right. If you make a, if you make a horror movie, there are so many low budget horror movies coming yeah. out. You know, I don't know how many Westerns were made and were released in 2021, but I'd wager that 
my 12 is a good portion of the ones that were released. You know? <laughs> at, least, at least like a quarter or a third of the total Westerns released that you, you year. You should be dominating that category, you know? Exactly. <laughs> they stand out. I guess is what I'm saying. If someone searches for new Westerns, they're bound to find my work. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. So um, Terror on the Prairie. Tell me how that came about. Well, like I said, I threw a Hail, Hail Mary and kind of reached out to Dallas actually while I was still making the 12 and uh, told him who I was. And, you know, Dallas is an amazing person. He, um, however much he's done, you know, this is a guy who made Bone Tomahawk. He's worked with yeah. Kurt Russell, Vince Vaughn, Mel Gibson. He's so approachable and he makes it a point to reply to people as much as he possibly can which i think is so honorable and he's such a role model in that way because i think some of us can get kind of go so wrapped up in our own stuff that we forget how important it is to communicate back and he's he's really good at it. so he got back to me and it's hilarious his first response was i saw your imdb picture i have i have i have serious beard envy of you <laughs> <laughs> this giant beard um at the time so and what a great response uh and he's like we need to talk and then we just started talking and he kind of said you know i don't know what it's going to be but i think that we will we'll work together at some point and then in early um 21 we were actually talking about making another Western, a different Western. And he was going to bring me on board as kind of a Western consultant slash associate producer. Mm -hmm. That didn't come together. Um, so that was disappointing, but we kept talking. And then they were going to make a movie with Gina in uh, Tennessee called White Knuckle. Mm -hmm. And they ran into some issues because of the vaccine mandates they were going through with SAG. And they pivoted very quickly kind of like I just did on the five. I had to move from this John Wayne remake blue steel to the five within a week before oh production. My goodness. Yeah, it was crazy, but they, they did something kind of similar where they said, he called me up and he's like, we're, yeah. we're going to have issues with SAG and this vaccine stuff. So basically we're going to pivot. We're going to make a Western in Montana instead, pack your bags. I need you there in two weeks. Wow. Um, which was so cool. I mean, I, when I heard that, I was just like, this is one of the best moments in my career. <laughs> and then, you know, you got out, I got out there and I just got to work with some great people. Speaking of partners, he's got this producer, Amanda Presmick, who's just amazing. I mean, she's just an ideal producer. Hopefully we, she and I get to team up together at some point mm -hmm. um, because she's definitely the kind of producer I would want if I'm directing a project and I was able to learn from her and she really helped me adapt to the bigger budgeted stuff because I, I, I would do things with the best of intentions sometimes and she'd be like, uh, Travis, and I'd be like, okay, I'm sorry. You got to remember <laughs> that I normally work on low budget stuff and I'm normally my own boss. So, but she was super patient in helping me adapt yeah. to the making a multi-million dollar movie, which was, wow. which was cool. Yeah. yeah. And in those movies or those productions, you, you have your job and you don't step outside that job. You know, it's much different. Well, than... to some degree, I kind of did because like I said, I was the Swiss army knife. So <laughs> they brought me on a Western consultant, kind of huh. with the idea I would help uh, oversee wardrobe, oversee the guns, make sure everything was period correct, or is, is at least as period correct as we could reasonably get it. Yeah. And then slowly, it would, you know, we'd be in a production meeting, and we would go through all the things that needed to be done. And they would say, well, we still haven't found a baby. And I'd raise my hand, and I'd be like, would you like me to find a baby? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, wow. or wh whatever it was, you know, I would basically yeah. say, I think I can do that. I think I, I, I can track down a baby. <laughs> so I ended up doing so many things. And, and then during, you know, I ended up doing stunts. I lucked out, ended up playing a role in the movie. Um, they offered me a, a small part, which was great. Uh, and then even during production, week two of the four week production, they came to me and said, you know how to operate a camera, don't you? 
I'm like, yeah, I've shot some of my own movies. They go, okay, you're now on second camera. <laughs> wow. So I ended up being second camera for three weeks of the production. <laughs> so yeah, I did not stay in my lane on that film. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, that's good. You need people like that sometimes, you know. Exactly. You need at least a couple of them. But other than that, yeah, you've got a 50, 60 person crew. You've got the ability to have people just really focus on what they're good at, which is great. And I would love to kind of do that on my productions. Yeah, that's true. That's good. Um, are you going to get a break? To some degree, yeah. Like I said, I have to remind myself to slow down, remind myself to take a break. Uh, now that the five is behind me, I, I can really focus on writing. So a break for me doesn't look the same way that it does for some people. A break for most people means they don't do anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> a break for me means I do less. Um, so, but I'd really yeah. love to write and, and I'm working on a book about Western directors. I'm working on more screenplays. So, so yeah, that's, that's the goal, right? Yeah. Slow down a little bit, enjoy life. I've been dating someone. Um, it's hard to keep a relationship when you're living this kind of lifestyle. So yeah. I keep telling myself, you know, just kind of enjoy this person's company and, and take a, take a deep breath for once. <laughs> So do you do anything like your production company? Do you do other services or uh, corporate video or anything like that? Or are you just focus completely on micro budget films? You know, we've, we've done little things over the years, kind of when it found us. But when I started my company, you know, a lot of people said, yeah, you need to get into corporate, all of this stuff. Yeah. And maybe they were right. Maybe I could have done that generated more income used that to make features but i'd seen a lot of people who'd gone that route yeah and they got so consumed with the business corporate side of things that they never were able to come back around and do their creative yes, product that's right that's the problem yeah so i just kind of said you know what i'm gonna live a very bare bones lifestyle and i'm gonna kind of do whatever i want to uh, mm -hmm. i'm gonna make the projects i want to make and if I wanted to do, make a film, I pretty much just said, this is what I'm doing. And I went out and found the money and did it. So um, it was a great way to work and live for, for mm -hmm. 12 years. You know, yeah. it, it, it's been quite a journey, but the work is out there. I think that's what matters. So, so yeah, I really, I didn't go that route, but there's nothing wrong with it. Everybody's yeah. got to pick their way. So. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. So when you're raising money and you're looking, you, you've probably got a really good, um, um, I don't want to say scheme down, but you've, you've, you know what you're doing in, in presenting a package to investors to get them excited and where to find yeah. those people. Yeah. Well, I've, I've gotten better at it over the years. Uh, having a good track record is nice for yeah. completion, having a couple of movies that were profitable, like blood country. Uh, and then my uh, movie I made called porches and private eyes, those done really well. Um, considering their budgets and being able to point to that is really nice, you know, mm -hmm. and then just trying to be responsible with the money yeah. and how much money you get. I mean, even I think Dallas said, you know, every movie needs to be made for the right amount of money for what it can make. Yeah. Well, if you spend $200,000 on one of these low budget Westerns that doesn't have anybody in it, you're not going to make the money back. Right. Um, but I saw that there, there seemed to be a range that you could work in. And that's why these companies give people $20,000 to make movies. The reason they're doing that is because that's what they know they can make back. Yeah. Uh, so now the goal for me is to figure out, okay, I want more funds to work with. How do I raise it? And how do I do so in a responsible way that I think can still make the investors a profit? Right. And how can you make a living doing that? Because to me, a twenty thousand dollar film is you're you're not making anything. Yeah, and for the five, thankfully, I was able to negotiate a small fee on top of that um, for me. Um, but still, it's like, yeah, I've definitely been living a bare bones Spartan lifestyle for years, mm -hmm. and it starts. You know, the older you get, it starts to wear on you a little bit. Yeah. You, 
you maybe want a little bit more comfort in life. Um, not a lot, but a little bit, a little bit more stability. So I'm looking at that, but I'm also, it's tough for me because I also really love my freedom and love my um, yeah. ability to do what I want to do. And it's like, well, how do you choose between those two things? Where's the balance? Right, right. So what's it, what do you have uh, lined up for the future at this point, your next productions, anything? So, yeah, slow, I'm slowly kind of preparing to make this Western series that I developed with the, that guy, John <laughs> Mars, that, that ended up being an essential part of the 12. And I'm kind of, you couldn't say that I'm really in pre-production yet, but I, I'm, I'm working on budgeting, scheduling, and rewriting our episodes. It felt like after the 12, the next big endeavor to take on would, would be to a do series. a series. Yeah. yeah. So I, I really like the story we came up with. Uh, it's set in, in a, in a uh, town that doesn't exist at all anymore. It's just rubble called Contention. Contention mm -hmm. It was really very close to tombstone and it gets mentioned in a lot of westerns um so we thought it would be interesting to explore that uh not telling a true story but just explore it as yeah. a setting and um so working on that and and really i saw after the 12 that one of the things i need to improve most on was my writing mm -hmm. and um so i've been just trying to get better at writing make the contention scripts stronger, um, make the new scripts that I work on more character based and less plot based. And I'm seeing some good results. So yeah, I'm kind of planning on hopefully doing contention during 2023, mm -hmm. if, if everything continues to come along. Um, and then just kind of writing in the meantime. And, uh, you know, for the first time in a long time, really just opening myself up to opportunities of being hired by people like Dallas and yeah. other folks like that. And, yeah. and as an actor or producer or whatever. Mm -hmm. You had mentioned at some point that you were publishing your screenplays. Mm -hmm. How's that going? So, well, it's an experiment, right? Yeah. And it's not something that's at least a, a very common idea, but it occurred right. to me, I'm, you know, scripts, they get written, they get sent to a few producers, right. and then they just sit on the shelf. Why can't a script be fun reading material? Mm -hmm. um, they're not that difficult to read, you know? Right. And, and so I think even the common person could pick up a script and after getting used to the format, after a few pages, really enjoy it. Um, so I first did this with a, a script I wrote, The Swamp Fox Brigade, which is about Revolutionary War hero Francis Marion. They made a movie kind of about him years ago with Mel Gibson called The Patriot, but they totally Hollywoodized the story. Yeah. So I wanted to do something closer to the truth. And I tried it out. And, you know, like a lot of ideas, when you're first trying them, they don't take off immediately. So my perspective on it is be consistent continue to release these things and hopefully with time the idea will pick up and we're, mm -hmm. we're doing it with the first episode of contention mm -hmm. um and it just gives it also gives people an opportunity to kind of get interested in the project you know yeah. one of the things i've started to pivot i'm i'm sort of shifting the way i'm doing things because of some some filmmakers i've talked to including richard walter who used to be the ucla chair at the screenwriting uh program there and a lot of, of screenwriters are writing a novel first and then adapting their, their novel to a screenplay. But then they at least have something to get out into the world and, and it's an IP that they then own and it becomes a different negotiation deal. Yeah, I've actually kind of started to do that. It's funny you mention it. I'm you know not used to writing novels, so I'm going about it a little bit backwards. I've created this character named the Blackbird, who's kind of like a Western Jack Reacher. Mm. And I'm writing the screenplays first because that's the form I'm used to. Yeah. And then I'm taking the script and I'm novelizing it. Okay, um, good. So I'm kind of doing it the opposite way that you yeah. discussed, but I'm excited about that. Like you said, Western fiction is uh, a thing <laughs> and it might be a way to generate interest in making a movie at some yeah. point i know in my experience when i've handed out scripts to producers that i've been working with 
there, there's a few of them that j- they just cannot get into the screenplay format and read it and understand it and enjoy it. To me, mm-hmm. I love it. I love that format. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's an impediment to them. And I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe if you were able to give them a novel and they, were, they could read that instead, which would be easier for them, maybe, maybe investors have the same kind of, of response to a screenplay because they, they're not really understanding what it's, what it's about. And I've also found for myself that I often, when I write a screenplay, it's too long and then I got to shorten it and then I start cribbing things that it then becomes, I understand it. But after I read it, read back what I wrote, I'm like, how's anybody going to understand this? This is, this is horrible. (laughs) (laughs) I've taken way too much out, but you know, you're trying to get to that certain page count. um, And that sort of kills the reader's experience. If you're not careful. Yeah, Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I I think a lot of people are not used to reading them. And that's another thing by publishing the scripts is I think it's kind of cool. Some people might be interested in, in oh, this, this is what a script is. This is how a script reads. That's true. You, know, you can find them online, but holding a paperback is a little bit different, you know? Yeah. So who knows? Uh, I'm, you know, film is kind of the whole film process has unfortunately, I think been too much of a closed door type of thing, meaning that, productions kind of keep all of their process kind of secretive and sure there's Mm -hmm. books and stuff like that but my whole approach has been try to be as transparent as you can share about the process the journey uh like i did in the the book about the 12 westerns like i do in my weekly articles um and like i did one on page count yesterday on facebook and a bunch of people were writing i had no idea that a page was supposed to equal a minute and that there was a standard number of this and this i'm like we got to share as much as possible so that people can learn that's true that's very good so you're that's one of the ways you're building your audience is by sharing information as well so you you feel that that's a a necessary part of your filmmaking endeavors is to keep an audience educated and interested by providing them content yeah i think so i you know i think it's a way to get people involved Mm -hmm. uh, in the process is for them to see how the machine is working and obviously not everybody's going to be interested in that but i've found that that a lot of people are i mean if i in an ideal world i would be going live on facebook on set all the time and letting people actually watch the process because they would be more literate in terms of how this whole thing comes together um so hopefully with contention i hope to really blow off the the doors and you know we're gonna probably do crowdfunding at some point for that and some of the crowdfunding things is going to be kind of like kind of a all access type of idea of you get to read the scripts you get to see it's you maybe even a dailies thing. There might mm. be even a dailies perk where people get to see dailies um, who donated, you know, just to, to really kind of let people go along for the whole journey. Right. Right. Yeah. I think crowdfunding is, is really interesting approach. Even if you have a lot of investment already, because it's one of those points where you can make a lot of noise about what you're going to be doing and gaining interest and then you gain some followers that that will carry through. If you don't crowdfund, that whole element is gone. <laughs> yeah, you get people involved. With actually one of my films, we with Porches and Private Eyes, we made the film for fifteen thousand invested, and we did a crowdfunder in um, post production. And we need, you know, we use some of the funds to uh, to finish post on the movie, mm-hmm. but. But a lot of it we used to pay for the DVDs, pay for the yeah. T-shirts. And actually, a big chunk of it was the first chunk that went back to paying back the investors. Yeah. So it can be used for other means than just raising the total budget of the film. Right. For- That's right. That's cool. Yeah. Now, do you own any of your films? Or have you, have you sold them all? No, I own most of them. Okay. Because, like okay. I said, I, I really it's very difficult to make a distribution deal and not um, make a bad one. Yes. So I've been very hesitant, even the 12 that I've like kind of said, okay, what I did was I was like, okay, you, you, this person gets Walmart, this person gets Tubi, but no one gets everything. And I definitely keep certain things because yeah. I'm paranoid about giving all the rights to someone. And then right. they told 
just, you know, mislead me, but I own a majority of them, which is mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, um, it is. But, you know, and, and hopefully the, the hope is that eventually that becomes an investment, you know, yeah. that, that I had by putting all this time and effort into them and that, you know, they'll always be out there earning something. Yeah. That's great. So what advice would you give to a youngster who maybe had a few short films under their belt and they decide, I want to make a micro budget film? What, what kind of advice would you give them to help them avoid pitfalls, to help them to realize the benefits of doing micro budget level filmmaking? Yeah, I think the, the main thing I usually tell people who are looking at making their first feature is don't overthink it. A lot of people want to make some masterpiece, want to make, mm -hmm. you know, just this, they have these kind of wild dreams of I'm going to make something that's going to get into Sundance, it's going to launch my career. And I kind of just want to tell them, you know, that's how it works for a couple rare individuals. But yeah. most of us have to make films, learn from our mistakes and keep making movies, which was my path. So I would say, don't overthink it. You just need to write a good story and go out and make it and see it as an opportunity to learn the form and then learn from what you did right and the next one you know my mom one of the greatest things my mom ever said to me was she said the day after you wrapped your first feature film you were already talking about what you wanted to do next clearly it was not a get it out of your system kind of thing it is your system so, <laughs> but that's a I wise love, mother <laughs> yeah she really understood that it was a serious thing for me at that point that it wasn't yeah. something that I was just trying out you know and yeah. I think that thing too is you know so many people go to film school and they never make a movie afterwards yeah make make your feature and see if it's something you really want to do you yeah. know is this, um, is this a life you really want to live but also you know if I could speak to myself back in the day before I made those films I would have said be a little bit more conscious of the business side of things. Mm -hmm. Even with this thousand dollar movie you're making, try to make revenue on it. Try to try to yeah. establish a track record of profitability and just keep building and building on top of that. Mm -hmm. I didn't really figure that out until I was like five or six micro budget films deep. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I would tell myself if I could go back in time. Mm. So what was your first film? It was called The Big Something. It was a comedy murder mystery set in a record store because um, I had worked in record stores for years before I went full time to film. So I drew on some of that. And, uh, you know, that was one where everybody was telling me, like, I remember I called some, you know, film professors and advisors and told them i'm trying to make this film for twenty thousand dollars they go twenty thousand dollars you're a fool is what one of them said and then i made it for a thousand dollars i basically was just like you know i'm not taking no for an answer i'm getting this movie made and i think yeah. you got to kind of have that kind of determination mm -hmm. to do what you want to do and so when was this what year was this 2011 okay is when I made the first feature yeah. So that's when things started really getting interesting with digital filmmaking, where things costs were coming down, the quality of the the gear was getting good. Yeah, DSLRs. Um, we shot on DSLRs for years because all of a sudden you were getting those Canons that that you could get relatively cheap and shoot a film on, and it still yeah. looked okay. And a lot yeah. of it was the glass that you used or the way you used the that's camera. Right which is the way now with the cell phone shooting revolution, you know, we shot one of the 12 Westerns entirely on a, on a cell phone and uh, yeah. which was something I'm very proud of. And I think that's also when people see that film, they're like, I can't believe this was shot on a phone. Yeah. I'm like, tool is in your pocket to make movies. You just got to <laughs> know. It's what you do with it that counts. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you were using some pretty nice cameras on your your 12 films. Yeah, we mostly, uh, one of my cinematographers uh, who lives in Arizona, his name is Nick Fornwald. He invested in a camera package, uh, Black Magic Ursa Mini 2. Yeah. And I ended up, even the films that he didn't shoot, I ended up renting it on several of the movies. And it was okay. it be a great package that I got really used to working with and could rely on. So we shot most of them on mm -hmm. that. 
And, uh, you know, I've never been a camera, camera guru, camera geek, you know, yeah. uh, I just focus on how to frame things up and right. how to use the, the tool the you know, as best as I can. Yeah. That's incredible. Do you, are you, do you have any relationships with other micro budget filmmakers where you guys can commiserate? <laughs> yeah. You know, not traditionally. Um, but one thing that's really cool that's happened and again, I have to thank Dallas for it, is a lot of people have found me from being connected with Bonfire Legend on Instagram and all that stuff and him sharing my work. And now I have all these people reaching out to me saying, what you've done is so inspiring to me just to get it yeah. done. And I love hearing that. And I've kind of not really a mentor to these people, but maybe a, an advisor here and there. Yeah. And they can kind of relate to what I've tried to do. So that's really cool. You know, even just today, talking to someone, an actress who's putting together a, a thing in Indiana that connected with me through Daily Wire and Bonfire. And, uh, and she's just saying, I take so much inspiration from your get it done mentality. Yeah. And she's like, I don't know if you'd be interested in jumping on my production. I'm like, Send, send me an offer. <laughs> send me an offer and let's talk. So I'm, I have a disease. It's called I love making movies. So, yeah. uh, you know, someone, I'm like that, you know, those bank robber movies where they say, I'm done. I'm never doing it again. Someone <laughs> says, well, I got a job. And you're, oh, all, right, all right, I'm back in. <laughs> I mean, I love the get it done mentality. I, I spent, I, I interviewed a bunch of people, filmmakers, and uh, uh, even a, a guy who did a documentary on Nollywood, because Nollywood became, went from zero to the outpacing the United States and the amount of films it's outputted in 20 years, That's which crazy. is insane. But they have this get it done mentality and they just go out and do their films. Um, and you know, you, you're sort of in that, in that world where, I mean, I think we have to, it's, I think one of the things that's, that's hit me the most, cause I've been in this business for 30 years and I've done a couple little animated films cause I'm in animation. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've always been wanting to do live action stuff and, um, I've got scripts, they're sitting around, we're trying to get them, you know, with producers and get funding how long are you going to wait until you realize, you know what, I should just do a down and dirty film and at least get it under my belt, you know, and doing a film is actually helps you to do the next film and do another property and that sort of thing. So um, there's, there's a lot to be said to, to just getting something under your belt where you've done it. Um, and, you know, I know in, in discussions I have with pro producers, when I bring this up to them, that everyone still has this Hollywood barrier mentality where, well, we can't do it for that like that because we have to make sure it's a good film. We don't want to use, you know, non-name actors and all that sort of thing. I'm like, why not? You know, you, you could find some people who are surprising. You can work with them. It, it's your craft and your talent and being able to put that thing in place and do something with it. Um, that's more important than getting the, the pro perfect budget, the perfect, and you're not going to get the creative freedom that you have with a micro budget film on a Hollywood film when you get these. Absolutely. Investors. Yeah. Unfortunately, that Hollywood mentality will never go away. It's kind of like the whole idea. If someone came to me and said, we want you to make a $10 million movie, I would probably say, how about we make 10, $1 million movies? Yeah, exactly. And they would probably say goodbye because they don't respect that. I remember there's a great story of Francis Ford Coppola bringing Roger Corman to yeah. the set of The Godfather. I think when they're doing the wedding scene, he's like, you're about to see me waste more money than we would <laughs> use for like 10, 10 of your movies, right? In just a couple days of filming, but it's the only thing these people respect, right? That's and, incredible. And it's sad, but that's kind of the system, but that's why roger corman's come about you know yeah. and that like because there has to be an alternative to the yeah. system yeah. so and the system is has its own appetite because it wants to do things that are safe things that mm -hmm. have a a typical known structure and the way of doing things and so in a sense it's it cripples uh the artistic creative experimentation that you want to see in films yeah and i think it 
you know, if you make the right kind of project, it really can stand out. You know, someone like yeah. Sean Baker, who went out and shot the film Tangerine on iPhones and, and yeah. it did, it did end up making an impact. And the irony of Hollywood is that they play it safe and don't take chances until someone on the edge, on the yes. outskirts, like Dennis Hopper makes an easy rider. It becomes a hit. And then Hollywood goes, that's the new safe thing. That's the, that's the, <laughs> that's, that's the thing that we now have to replicate, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just like, you know, now Yellowstone, the series is a hit. And it's like, okay, then we got to make more of that, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, people were saying for years, Westerns are dead. So it's yeah. it takes someone basically going against the, the standard to set the new standard. Yeah. And you're doing that. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. All, all I know is I'm, I'm just proud that I've created the work, you know, the work's out there. And now, because I did have to get it done and just, just got a lot of work done, I'm kind of at a point where I'm like, maybe it's time for me to switch gears and maybe it's okay to wait. Yeah. You know, I've already done the, the don't wait for anyone. Maybe it's right. time to, I'm going to wait till the project's right, till I have the right team, till I have... Right. You know, um, and I think it's good to reassess um, your career as you go. You oh, I think so. Yeah. You can't just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again yeah. without, you know, changing course sometimes. Right. Even if you're very successful at it, you still want to be examining totally. yourself and changing because the, the marketplace is changing and, and the way we, you know, uh, consume content is changing. Absolutely. All the time. Yeah. And I mean, I've loved this book. This is, this has been, I mean, this is a great book for, like you said, there, there's a lot of inspiration here. It's down and dirty. It's in, it's in the, it's the story of how to do this kind of thing by watching you go, go about it. And maybe a follow-up if I can suggest would be how to make a micro budget film by Travis Mills. And I think that would be yeah, well, I've taught some of those class. I've kind of done that in little forms, like doing little Facebook classes and stuff. And I probably need to condense a lot of those ideas. Yeah. Even the articles I'm writing weekly, it maybe eventually need to kind of be condensed and, and repacked mm -hmm. to a form that people can can purchase and, and read in its entirety. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. Thank you so much, Travis, and good luck with everything you're doing. It's been a wonderful conversation. It's an honor to talk to you. Great. Thanks, Travis. Thanks. Take care. In the show notes of this episode, you'll find links to Travis's book, The Making of 12 Westerns, and links to where you can follow the filmmaking adventures of Travis Mills. Most of Travis's Westerns can be found on Tubi or Amazon, and there's a link in the show notes to Travis's film page, which lists his films and what platforms they're available on. And Travis sometimes teaches short webinars on micro-budget filmmaking, and I encourage you to take one of these, so follow him on his Facebook page so you'll be notified when his next one is offered. Our time together draws to a close, valiant filmmaker. We trust your heart has been warmed and your soul nourished. Your host has been Todd Schaefer, creative director of the faith-based independent production house Glorious Films and animation director at Tonic DNA, where he toils on productions for the major Hollywood establishment. If you wish to support the work of the ministry or simply buy your overworked host a fancy $5 coffee to keep him warm and caffeinated as he pecks out his next script, you can do so on our website at ministryofmotionpictures.org. Again, that's ministryofmotionpictures.org. And you can help spread the word by feeding the algorithms when you share, like, link, follow, subscribe or leave a nasty comment on our social media. Until we see you again, I adjure you, in the name of our Lord, go forth and boldly create film. What we do in life echoes in eternity.